been preaching, this is hard for me to say, but Brian's been preaching over 30-something years, and uh, I didn't even realize I was that old, but uh, it is true. He's uh, been very faithful in his ministry, and I certainly appreciate that. He's here with his wife, Sanja, tonight. She's sitting back here. Uh, They have two daughters who are grown and two sons-in-law and uh, two grandsons that they're very proud of as well. Uh, A lot of things can be said about Brian. But the one that really sticks in my mind the most is that he is a servant. Um, He loves the Lord with all of his heart. And Brian loves God's people. And Brian loves God's word. So all of those will mix here tonight as he presents his lesson. And I hope that you will uh, be attentive to what uh, he says and what God's word says to each one of us. What a treat to be here. Really been looking forward to this. Uh, I'm excited for you next week. Uh, you get to hear a great speaker. We have Danny Camp at our church building. He has uh, satellite hours with Agape uh, Mondays. and So uh, it's always a treat to, to see him. And I know his four lessons will be uh, very encouraging to you, uh, very uplifting as, as you think about marriage enrichment. So sorry that I can't be with you for, uh, for those. Uh, we had a good meal tonight, uh, David and Shelley and their daughters, and Jason and Amber and Maddie. Uh, delicious meal. I do have the princess of Preacher's Wives with me tonight. Uh, glad that uh, she could make the trip with us. Uh, Jason and family, uh, you know, his words were pretty brief, and that's a good thing, because he can tell you some stories if he's really honest, but uh, I won't tell any bad stuff on him. Uh, but he's been a great brother, and, and uh, it's always good when we can get together. Looking at our lesson this evening about service, uh, I've got the identity there. We're going to get a monitor on back here for me, so I don't have to turn around repeatedly, but uh, really looking forward to the lesson, uh, studying along with you. There was a boy that talked to his preacher. In fact, he had a a serious question for his preacher. He said, preacher, can I get in trouble for something that I didn't do? And the preacher said, well, no, sir, you cannot get in trouble for something you didn't do. And the boy said, that's good because I missed service last Sunday. That's that's very comforting to know. And so as you think about, well, that may not have been what the preacher had in mind. Uh, Can you get in trouble for not serving? I'm going to suggest, and I think you know the answer already, yes. Tonight as we look at some passages that will impress upon our minds and and remind us in most cases the glory of, of service, we want to be impressed with the idea that I need to serve. It's not something that's uh, forced upon me. It's something that if my heart is prepared right, if I'm I'm really the the disciple I need to be, I'm anxious about that. So thinking about your your theme of identity, and I see your your, uh, posters on either side of the wall there. Uh, I I put my my paper to, my my pen to paper uh, last Sunday for a little little ditty, a little poem. I'm going to share that with you also in the theme of identity. We live in a world that's struggling with who we are. We talk about an identity crisis. There are people that, that wrestle with gender identity. We've maybe had mistaken identity, or some of you have been a victim of identity theft. And you can go on and on with the references to that. In a world that's confused about who they are and why they exist and what they ought to be doing, we don't have to be as God's people. Here is something that might represent some of the confusion or the, the ambivalence in the world today. I don't know if I'm a man or woman. I don't know if I'm going or coming. I don't know if I'm short or tall. I don't know if I have height at all. I don't know if I'm rich or poor, if I have enough or need more. I don't know if I'm black or white. I don't know if I'm wrong or right. I don't know if I'm up or down, and I don't know if I'm in the country or in town. For all I don't know, you're sure amused. The one thing I do know is I'm confused. When God speaks about his people who we are, why we exist. This is one of the slivers of the the big piece of pie. You've looked at a lot of great lessons uh, already, I know, from a lot of great speakers. As we think about serving and the identity, I want to give you, uh, and this this is sure to to, uh, make some eyelids flutter, a Greek word study. I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm not going to get in deep with you at all, but, but looking at about six words in your Greek, uh, and the different, uh, there, there are noun forms and abstract and verbs. Don't let that confuse you. It confuses me. Here's a rundown. Let's do a word association with things that about six different words translated serve 
uh, speak to. One of those is the word assist. One who would be attending or an attendant. Minister is one of those generic, very, very general words for service. One who is a slave is an interesting uh, designation. Sometimes you refer to a slave in chains. And there are some aspects of our, our service for God being like that. One who is a subordinate. One who offers religious service. We get the word liturgy from one of those uh, Greek words. Those who uh, serve a charitable function. The word has shades of meaning to very menial attendance. Think about uh, maybe the, the most disparaged or hated job just because it's dirty and, and ugly and no one else wants to do it. That's one of the words translated uh, our service to God. And then the word that we get the word therapy from or therapeutics, a word that is service from a heart that is truly uh, engaged. It, it's a compassionate side. And so thinking about all those different terms, I'm not going to associate that with some of the scriptures we use. That word's a beautiful word as God thinks about it. And our, uh, our privilege to be in God's kingdom means that we are servants. Do you wait for inspiration to serve? I found an interesting quote here I want to share from Ernest Newman. Don't know who he is. But he says, The great composer does not set to work because he is inspired, but becomes inspired because he is working. Beethoven, Wagner, Bach, and Mozart settle down day after day to the job in hand as with uh, as much regularity as an accountant settles down each day to his figures. They didn't waste time waiting for inspiration. Do you get that? I, I know I need to serve, and there's part of me that wants to serve, but how do I go about it? Really what you do is you just start serving. And if my heart is not in it, ideally it will be. It'll come around, and as my, my hands and my feet are busy, the head and the heart will be engaged. Great servants had that mentality of just seeing the need and getting involved in it. I liked how one uh, kind of broke down several philosophies in the ancient world, in today's world as well. The Greeks were kind of a, about knowledge and about uh, wisdom, and so their theme would have been something like, be smart, educate yourself. The Romans would have been, be strong, discipline yourself. The Epicureans, the ones who thought that pleasure was all it was in life, like many today, would be uh, something along, uh, be satisfied, just indulge yourself. And then Jesus comes and throws all of those philosophies on their head. When his basic premise and the, the word that he used over and over, we'll look at some of those, is be a servant. Forget yourself. Subordinate yourself to a higher cause. There are some people that want to serve God. They just want to do it in an advisory capacity. And God does not need those types of servants, does he? How do you spell the word serve? It's not a spelling test. I know school is either here or just about to be. But I want to do on the next screen there an acrostic, letting each of the letters in serve represent an aspect scripturally of what it means to, to be a servant of God. We'll start with the S. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, you can spell it out. Some of you may want to take notes or or might want to jot some scriptures or other things along the line uh, as well. Sacrificial service. Here's what Paul said in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves to God, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, watch this, which is your reasonable service. Some of the versions have something like your, your spiritual act of worship. He goes on to say, don't be conformed to this world, but you be transformed by the renewing of your mind to prove the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. Look at the, the image there of, of sacrifice. Your living sacrifices. My purpose in being here on this earth is not to indulge me, not merely to satisfy my wants and my whims, but to be uh, on the altar daily for my Savior. In Matthew 20, I'm going to give you time to turn there. In Matthew 20, I want to start reading about verse 25. This is an interesting text because you've got uh, the mother of Zebedee's sons. They, these were James and John, apostles. She comes all the way back up in verse 20 of Matthew 20. Not with 2020 vision, I don't think. But she says, Master, I want something of you. He says, say it. What do you wish? I want you to grant these two sons of mine, James and John, to be on the right 
hand or side of you and the other on the left when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered and said, you don't know what you're asking for. Now, skipping down in verse 24, the 10, the other apostles hear it and they are greatly displeased. You know why, I think? It's because they didn't think of it first. They probably wanted that right hand and that left hand. And so they're, they're squabbling over it. You, you see how they're still works in progress? They've been with Jesus at least two years by this point, still learning. Jesus called them to himself in verse 25, and he makes a reference, first of all, to the rulers of the Gentiles. The ones who lorded over them, who exercised great authority over them, he says, that's not our model. Throw that out the window. That's not going to be the pattern here. What is it? Verse 26. It shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him what? Be your servant. How many of you want to be great? How many of you want to do it the way that Jesus said to do it? The world has all these ideas about what greatness is and our seizing it, our working it, uh, you know, stepping over others to climb the ladder of success. Jesus says greatness is in serving. Watch him continue verse 27. Whoever desires to be first, number one among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Did you catch that? Jesus, why did you come? Well, among the many answers to that question, uh, in the negative, I didn't come to be served. You don't see servants fawning over Jesus. He didn't have an entourage and, and all the luxuries that many would have uh, clamored for. No, I came to serve, to proactively look at the needs and the wants of other people. And so that's why I came, and, and ultimately to give his life a ransom. This is even pre-crucifixion. He's setting themself, uh, himself up for them to see what the, the greatest display of, of that service is. So Jesus not only taught, you need to be a sacrificial servant, more importantly, he modeled it. He lived it. As I think about the greatness of serving, I can't take you to a better example than Jesus. In Luke verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus is talking about discipleship. And he says, if anyone wants to come after me, let, uh, let him take up his cross. How often? Does your Bible say daily? Take up your cross, an instrument of cruel execution on a regular basis, not occasionally, not one time. Do it daily if you really want to be my disciple, because Jesus was doing, he took up a literal cross, obviously, for us. Philippians 2 is a, a beautiful, some call it a, a poem, very likely it was an early Christian hymn, starting about verse 5. Beautiful passage, I won't quote all of it, many of you know that. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. I like the RSV on that. Uh, he didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to. No, he came as a servant. He's born of a woman. And so all these steps of his self-imposed humiliation, his humility, uh, are, are marvelous tokens to me. Paul got the, the essence of that in the spirit of it in Galatians chapter 6, verse 17 where he says, don't let anybody trouble me anymore. Why? Because I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. The marks. The Greek word is stigma there. We know what that means. Paul says, I have suffered. He chronicles in 2 Corinthians 11, a lot of the mistreatment uh, up to that point in his life he'd gone through. Why? To hear Paul tell it, it's because Jesus went through that for me. And so even if it cost us that, I, I don't know a lot of my brothers and sisters in the Lord here or in other countries who are suffering or who have been scarred because of persecution. But the idea is even if it calls for that, I need to be willing to do it because of the Savior's uh, commitment to us. Let's go to the first E in the word serve for our second point here. I want to let that E stand for energetically. You know what it is to serve? Do you always have service and energy attached to it? Sanjay and I kind of joke as we go to some of the fast food establishments and, and some of the, the retail places, 
And I wonder, I'm sure it's not this way in Columbia. Couldn't be. But in other places we've been, it seems like some people really aren't that eager to serve you and to make your experience pleasant. Is that just kind of how it is? Some of you are shaking heads like that. Uh, I guess Chick-fil-A is maybe the, the one exception to that. Uh, I just want to brag on those folks. I've never had a bad experience there. But, but the idea is energy. God wants me to serve him not out of drudgery, not out of uh, kind of this, this sad compulsion at all. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. And he gives the answer why we ought to do it in the here and now and while we have opportunity, you're going to die one day. And when you're in the grave, you won't be serving. You won't have any opportunities to do that. For the time being, he's not dwelling on the afterlife. It's the idea, do it now. Someone said that's the Old Testament. Colossians 3 verse 23, written incidentally to bond servants. Paul in that... uh, and that passage talks about uh, family relationships, here's husbands and wives and children and, and all that. And then he says servants. Some of our first century brethren were slaves. They were Christians, but they were slaves. And Paul even says, in your service, in your servitude toward uh, the ones who are your masters, you need whatever your hand finds to do. He says, do it heartily, heartily. He goes on to say, you do it as to the Lord and not to men because you're going to receive from the Lord the reward of your inheritance. Listen, you serve the Lord Christ. Love that. How could I, as a first century slave, not liking that station in life, how could I change or improve my attitude? I'm thinking about, you know what, I'm rendering service maybe to a master that's not appreciating it and and maybe mistreating me. But beyond that, I am serving God in that. And so he's my real master. Anybody that I serve here on earth, I need to do it with an energy and with a zeal that would be allotted to Jesus Christ. You've heard the poems or anecdotes about if Jesus came to your house, if we really knew he was coming, wouldn't we give him our heart's best? Wouldn't we bend over backward to be the best host or hostess that he could possibly uh, find anywhere? Sure. And so the message of Jesus, as in Matthew 25, is, you know what, inasmuch have you done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to who? Me. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you uh, and thirsty and give you a drink and sick and in prison? And inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. That is a powerful principle. And remember how there are two classes and categories there, that great judgment scene. The ones who didn't do it and the ones who did it. Only one of those had the, the blessing, obviously, of our Savior there. I want to serve energetically. I like how some uh, people, as we think about the book of Acts, uh, the history book in our New Testament, say it is the book of Acts. It's not the book of intentions. These are some of the acts or actions of some of the apostles. And, you know, for a lot of us, we, we have good intentions. Give us an A for that. But the hard part is getting the, tra- the intentions off of the page, off of the to-do list, and translate that into life. You may be like me when I'm saying, Lord, give me opportunities to serve and help me to do it with the very best disposition possible. Albert Einstein wrote, It is high time that the ideal of success should be replaced with the ideal of service. The world takes notice. Sure it does. You know, there are people, you may not know that they are watching. You may not know that they are Uh, indirect eyewitnesses, but they see you serving one another. They see you serving in a family. They know that maybe for, uh, not because you had an assignment from a care team or a zone or something, but but you took that dish of food, you mowed that yard, you took someone to doctor's appointment, and the world often is is wanting to see what separates us. What really makes us tick as Christian, uh, as Christians, I'm telling you, one of those things is this that the subject we're discussing tonight, the service. When we're doing the right things, good things. Not because we're being forced to, prodded to, but because we want to, and, and there's that sense of zeal in it. 
I'm telling you what, that is a powerful sermon that every child of God can preach, young and old and, and male and female, black and white, any station in life. We have uh, this week, incidentally, our young people are doing uh, an SAK week, Simple uh, Acts of Kindness. They had several projects. Some of those are our members, uh, our widows, mowing yards and trimming branches and things like that. Several of those are reaching out in our community to people who are not Christians. And as you look at that, sometimes we, we, we poor mouth the younger generation, all oh, these millennials, and, and uh, you know, they're, they're so self-absorbed and all that. And, and I think about that, and what was I doing as a teenager? I'll tell you what, we didn't have stuff like that. I could have. I didn't have to be part of a youth group or have a, a full-time youth minister to, to schedule that. But I'm telling you, I believe that there is in the younger generation a sense already, we want to serve. We want to be utilized. And parents, here's the sweet thing, okay? When they do these trips and they go and they're serving others, you, you just make that simple transition and say, boy, you have done such a good job out there. Let's get you in your room while you're in the habit and, and clean off that, that top layer of debris. And, and let's, let's push you out in the yard here while you're in good practice and see how that can be used to your advantage. All right, just, just say it. Serve energetically. Let's get to the R and serve and let it represent a powerful word of reverence. I want to serve reverently. Joshua 24, verse 14. Joshua is telling the younger generation as he's about to depart from them that we are to serve the Lord in sincerity and in truth. Sincerity and in truth. If you were to look at the Old Testament, you'd see character after character. I mean, some of the heavyweights, the Moses and, and the Joshua's and Samuel's all coming back to the theme of serving the Lord. Should have made this uh, point at the outset, but, but it's a fine time to do it right now. I don't have to choose. Hear me on this. It's not a matter of me choosing, am I going to serve God or am I going to serve my fellow man? Now, I can serve people as a non-Christian for, for no other motive than, than just being a good guy. Or I can serve God, and it may not involve necessarily another person that I'm reaching out to. But it's a, a great possibility and a great truth that much of our service to God also involves our fellow man. You know, John, in, in 1 John, in those five chapters, repeats a sentiment, repeats a truth that's, that's worthy of our thought right here and our application. I can say that I love God, but if I don't love my fellow man... What's John say is the outcome of that? I'm a liar. I don't really love God if I don't love you. And you don't really love me or God if, if there's not that bond. It's not a matter of one or the other. Forget about separating them. Often there is a package deal. And so our service to our fellow man is an expression of our love even for God reverently. Hebrews 12 verse 28 is a good verse. It talks about us, I'll use one phrase here, serving God with reverence and godly fear. That reverence means I'm respecting God. I am not God. He's not a man. Numbers 23, 19, and I am not God. If I can get those two fundamental truths established firmly in my life, I'm in a good foundation right there. God is God, I'm not Him. I am to reverence Him, hold Him in the highest honor, and respect more than any mortal, more than every person who's ever lived combined. And so my service to God is with that awareness. In Luke 17, 7 through 10, you probably knew we'd get there. Jesus is picturing a, a servant who's come in uh, uh, from work. And now you say to him, you know what, why don't you rest? If I put your feet up and I'll bring you a sandwich and I'll, I'll serve you. No, that servant generally is told, uh, you fix my supper and then you can rest. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Here's what Jesus says as an application of that in Luke 17, verse 10. And so also when you've done all those things in service that, that God has asked you to do, have this mentality, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. And that word duty doesn't mean drudgery. Sometimes we read into that. My, uh, my mindset in serving God isn't, well, if I have to, if my parents, uh, maybe it'll get them off my case, or my husband or wife will quit nagging me or whatever. 
If I'm truly reverencing God, anything, everything is uh, out of appreciation for who He is. Donald Adams says, to give real service, you must add something which cannot be bought or measured with money, and that is sincerity and integrity. I might serve a person who laughs at me or mocks me or, or belittles uh, the Christian faith. You know what? If I'm okay with that or if I'm in a right relationship with God, it's not going to make me retaliate against them. It's not going to make me quit serving. I'm doing it out of reverence for the one who has blessed me so richly. The letter V in serve is voluntarily. Isaiah 6 verse 8, imagine this, this awe-inspiring vision. There, there's this vision of the Lord and, and, and smoke filling uh, the temple there. And here's what, uh, as he sees the, the angels and appearance of them, the question is asked, who will go for me? Whom shall I send? Remember what Isaiah said? Again, chapter 6, verse 8. Here am I, send who? Me. Here I am, send me. Volunteer service means you don't twist my arm. You don't prod me or, or, or uh, somehow give me a, a promotion or a badge or something to do it. I, I ought to do things whether you give me a t-shirt or not, okay? I think growing up, I had about three t-shirts uh, the whole time. I was a teenager, never got one. And, and these teenagers now can, can go out the door and there's a t-shirt. And I'm not faulting. That's not a bad thing at all, understand? But voluntarily, you know what Jesus did in John 13? Very unexpectedly, very awkwardly, context of the Last Supper, he takes, uh, takes a basin of water and he begins to wash the disciples' feet to wash their feet. Remember who speaks up? Very, uh, uh, very uncomfortable with it, Peter, of course. And he says, Lord, are you washing my feet? I, I don't think so. And Jesus says, well, if I don't wash you, you have no part. And then Peter says, well, if that's the case, head to toe. Let's do it all then. If that means I'm affiliated with you. And so Jesus ends that little object lesson. You call me Lord and teacher, and you say, right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. No one made Jesus do it. And Jesus wasn't saying, do it for brownie points. Do it so that you'll get your name in a brotherhood paper. Do it because it's the right thing. Bob Dylan had a song, came out in 1979, uh, you got to serve somebody. In the chorus of that song, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. That wasn't original with Bob Dylan. All the way back in Romans 6, that's what Paul wrote. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey, that ones you are whom you obey? Watch the two alternatives, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And then Paul says, God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of righteousness. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. How powerful is that? I serve voluntarily. I've got to get to the point, I think some do it, maybe as teens or preteens, others of us are harder cases where I'm looking for opportunities. No one has to beat me into doing it. Service can never become slavery to one who loves. J.L. Mass wrote, service can never become slavery to one who loves. When we were in Florence, Alabama, we had a, a copier, uh, several copiers, as every congregation does, but I remember one of them had a, a neat little business card on the outside there, and it had the phone number and address. Of course, we knew what that was, but this handwritten thing, joy in service, joy in service. And as I would go by that copier, I thought, man, that's just a great advertisement. It's a great principle. We, we need to be serving with joy. And then I realized, uh, to my chagrin a little bit later, Joy was the name of a lady that worked in the service department. And that was her phone number. And so uh, I thought, well, even though that's true, there is still joy in service to our God. And, and so I want to be that joyful servant. We're down to our final E, 
in serve enthusiastically. And you can say, well, that's kind of close to some of these other, sure it is, but enthusiasm. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, the end of the great resurrection chapter, Paul says, I want you to be steadfast and immovable or unmovable, depending on your translation, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Everything that I'm doing, whether anybody sees it or not, acknowledges it or not, all those acts of service, God has a record of. And he sees these not to, to exalt me or to honor me in some kind of a, a human way at all, but out of appreciation for, for I'm abounding in the work of the Lord. Wilfred Grenfell said that service is the rent that we pay for our room on earth. That's true. All of us ought to be serving. It's just that Christians have more of a reason. In fact, the best incentive for that. As I work to a close this evening, God does not ask us about our ability. Let me stop right there. He gave you some abilities, didn't he? You have talents. Some of you have some unique gifts that are used in a wide array or a variety. And some of you have the same gifts but it's just that we need a lot of people doing that same thing. I love to, to get to know people in the congregation and know what uh, is a hobby or a passion, something they, they can use. You know, 20 years ago, we didn't have people working uh, PowerPoint and a lot of the technological things that we have in congregations, but aren't you glad? Usually some of those folks that have had fewer birthday uh, candles on their cake are the ones that may be more gifted towards some of those things. But the idea is... I have an ability. Sometimes we, we focus more on our inabilities. I can't do this thing. I can't teach that class. I don't have a house big enough to host it. I can't do this or that. God is asking about generally our availability. Don't you love the people that here's obstacle and hurdle and thing in my way? How in the world am I going to get past that? I just tackle it and bite off a little bit at a time and before long I've done it. God is wanting available people. Interesting how he could use a shepherd boy. And some of the most reluctant ones, even thinking about a Jonah here that didn't have a heart for it originally. We need to be those people that write the blank check to God, sign our name on it and said, whatever it is you need. Lord, place in my lap. Make it very clear in my path who I need to serve, who I can reach out to, who might need encouragement from me. Make me a servant is one of the most beautiful songs in our books. And it's one of those as we sing it. I'm sure you lead it from time to time and sing it. It's hard to sing because there are times I don't want to be a servant. It would be a lot easier to do something else or, or just to, to rest on my laurels or something. Service to a just God, or rather a just cause, rewards the worker with more real happiness, do you believe this, and satisfaction than any other venture in life. As I read that quote today, it hit me that the ultimate just cause in the world, in the world is, God's cause. is God's cause. Is there a better there one a better or greater, one than, greater the than the kingdom of our Heavenly, of our Father, Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ? Christ? Our service to this, to this ultimate just cause, cause really lends itself to happiness. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you have gone home just dog-tired because maybe for hours you slaved in the kitchen for a fellowship meal and maybe you put the food out and then stayed around and put the trash up or whatever. Hopefully you left with a song in your heart that night. Why? Because God had given you the health and the ability to be with your church family. And to do those to things, do those maybe things. Others, others couldn't do or wouldn't do, but that service can bring a happiness and a satisfaction. God designed it to. I close with these admonitions to many of you who are already faithful and fervent workers. Keep it up. Don't let anything. Now, let me put an asterisk right there. Your health might do that. It always pains always me to talk with older Christians, Christians who feel guilty sometimes, sometimes struggle sometimes. with the idea, the idea I'm not able I'm now not to able do now what, to I do what I did. And I tell them, God's not expecting you to do that. Do the best you can. Find another find niche. niche. There's something There's you can something do even, do, if, even it if it is praying for every member in the congregation, congregation each day. 
For those of you serving, still serve. For those of you serving a little bit, and maybe you're maybe a, maybe a new convert, you're just kind of getting your feet wet about what all this is about, let me encourage you to serve more than you're doing. You may have to go to an elder or a deacon and say, hey, I'm kind of interested in this ministry. I need some more information. Can I take some baby steps to maybe get more involved than, than I could? You see, don't wait for them to come to you. Go to them. Just cut out the middleman. Just, just go to them and say, hey, I, I know I want to, and, and, and let me do it. And if there are some that aren't serving at all or haven't served, let me encourage you, it's not a better time. I hope beyond some of the quotes and, and illustrations and things like that, that God's Word has spoken to you this evening about the joy and the glory and the importance of service. And while again, anybody can serve, even non-Christians, there is something special about God's man or God's woman. This evening as we think about the invitation, if you are not yet a Christian, what you need to do, first of all, is come over and be added to God's family. Let Him regard you and bless you as a son or a daughter. And then you're in the environment, you're in the place where you can be utilized in a way that will maximize those benefits for you and for others as well. In Ephesians, the great book, we find a reference to our transgression. We are sinners, as in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Paul paints a very uh, graphic picture of being aliens and estranged from God and then sinners and transgressors. But in that same chapter, there is God's transformation. Our transgression, God's transformation for us. Why? Because He's rich in grace and mercy and love and, and the, the blessing of Jesus. And then here's the next step. It is our trust. God, you've done God, all you've done for me all for that you can, that you can, can do. do. And now my and response, now my to, response that, to that, Ephesians 2, by grace you're grace saved you're through saved. faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. God. My, faith my faith is prompting me to, prompting me to obey, obey anything, anything and everything that God has asked God me to do. You find that, that a confession of Jesus, Jesus repentance, repentance uh, uh, a prerequisite, a prerequisite to, our baptism, to our baptism, our washing, our washing is, is illustrated in the New Testament, the New even in this book of Ephesians that we, uh, we're closing our reference in. This evening, if you would come to Him in obedience, what a wonderful new beginning it would be for you. If you as a brother or sister need to simply come and say, I'm weak or I need prayers, I want to be a better servant, what a great opportunity for us to pray with you and let that, uh, let that desire of your heart be made known. While we together stand and sing, won't you come?